Welcome back to Medical Engineering, Medical Imaging Systems. And today we want to talk about another very, very important concept, and this is sampling and quantization. So this is the process that is involved to convert a signal from analog domain into digital domain. Very important, and you will see that everything we do in medical imaging systems, as soon as it gets digital, you have to know about the concepts of digitization and sampling quantization. So I hope you will enjoy the next couple of videos. This won't be too long of a video, but fundamental concepts that you really need to know about if you want to make a career in medical engineering and in particular you're interested in digitization of any kinds of signals. Okay, here we go with sampling. And sampling is the process of getting a signal essentially into a digital computer. So sampling is the reduction of a continuous signal onto a discrete signal. And we want to do it in a way that we don't lose any information. So this means that we have to discretize along the time axis. So this is shown here on the right hand side. We have to essentially figure out the continuous signal at certain points. So these are indicated with the arrows here on the right hand side. So we have to sample the signal at these time points. And this is of course discrete because we cannot store infinitely many variables or observations in our computer. And the other thing is we need to quantize. And this means that we also have to assign discrete values on the value axis. So we cannot just save infinitely many values in our computer. So we also have to have a step size here in the quantization. This is the main problem of sampling and digitization. And the key problem that we're actually facing is how do we select the parameters, essentially the step size in between the samples and the step size in between the value such that we don't lose any information. And on the other hand, we also want to be able to use as little space as required. So we don't want to have excessively many of these sampling steps, because if I have to sample twice as often, I need twice as much space, and I also need to process twice as much data. So this is really crucial to set these spacings here correctly, such that nothing really goes wrong. And things can go wrong quite a bit. This is what I want to show you guys here in this plot. So here I have an input signal and this is the red curve. And now I decide to sample at the black dots. And you see that I chose them at some arbitrary spacing. And what you can see in this example is I always have the same distance between the black dots. So I get some values and the values are created exactly where the sampling frequency then hits again our red curve. So I produce those black dots. And now I have the black dots and I want to restore the original signal. And if you look very closely, you see that these black dots, they can be explained by a different sine wave. They actually can be explained by a sine wave of a much lower frequency. And this effect is called aliasing. As soon as you do a wrong sampling, what will happen is aliasing. So you're no longer able to reconstruct the original signal. And it's not just that there is faint mistakes or something. If you do the sampling wrong, you get completely different signals. So they look entirely different because you didn't obey the sampling frequency. This is also an effect that um, emerges if your visual system is being 
oversampled, yeah? then there are suddenly effects that you can't explain. And I think the most frequent analogy that we find in the human visual system is the sampling of a spinning wheel. If a wheel rotates too quickly, you can see that the actual wheel seems to be turning backwards. And this is because your visual system is exposed to a frequency that is higher to something that it can actually explain. And it will then reconstruct in your brain a signal that doesn't make sense. And the fast spinning wheel then looks like it's turning backwards. And this is because it is rotating at a frequency that your perception is not able to comprehend. And then you're reconstructing something that doesn't make sense. <laughs>
his glasses. There's a reflection. Anyway, we have a couple of implications that we've seen by this sampling frequency. And now I want to show you a couple of sampling frequencies that are quite common in several applications. So this is not only medical domain, but some domains where you know signals and digitization probably. So speech, for example, has a maximum frequency of 8000 Hertz. 8 kilohertz is the maximum frequency that is contained in speech, which means that if you are sampling at 16 kilohertz, you are able to reconstruct speech entirely. So your articulators, your mouth and vocal folds and so on, they are not able to produce frequencies that are higher than 8000 Hertz. Sometimes you have also telephone channels that have a reduced frequency. So they sample only with 8000 Hertz, 8 kilohertz. So for example, some mobile phones used to have that in, in older standards. And these channels, you will have trouble differentiating certain sounds. So for example, you're not able to differentiate F and S. So if you look at my lips, you will very clearly see the difference F and S. So these are both fricatives and the fricatives have essentially the highest frequencies that are contained in human speech. So these are essentially the noises that are generated by the S and F, S and F. And they cannot be differentiated over some telephone channels. So be careful when you use those channels. And this is also the reason why when people are spelling certain characters, they introduce the NATO alphabet, because sometimes the information cannot be encoded over that channel. And then you find surrogates in order to make sure that the correct information was transmitted. If you think about compact discs, so, uh, so audio, then a very frequent frequency limit for sampling is 44.1 kilohertz. So this was the sampling frequency of the compact disc. And you may not remember, this is a CD This looks like this. Maybe you've seen that with your grandparents. Probably don't have stuff like this at home because everybody is using streaming and MP3 players anymore. But the CD, the compact disc, had a frequency limit of 44.1 kilohertz. By the way, this is very evil punk music. So you probably want to don't want to listen to this anyway. And this is because human perception, human hearing has a frequency limitation of 20 kilohertz. So you can't hear things that are above 20 kilohertz. If you have very good hearing, you may be able to hear frequencies above, but it never goes beyond 22 kilohertz. So even the best perception stops at 22 kilohertz which means that if you sample at 44.1 kilohertz, you will not be able to distinguish the digital signal from the original analog signal. And it's a perfect reconstruction. So this brings us to the 44.1 kilohertz in the compact disc. If you have other species like orcas, whales, when they sing the orca calls, you have to choose higher sampling frequencies. So there you need to pick at least 96 kilohertz in order to be able to really get the full information. So if you listen to orca calls sometimes in, you know, television broadcasts, they have been resampled. So they have been compressed in order to be audible for the human ear. So this is if you want to really hear the entire call, you need frequency compression in order to make it audible for a human being. Also, the vision system has frequency limits. And one is, for example, the retina display. If you heard about that, this has uh, 150 pixels per centimeter. And this is so small that you're not able to see the individual pixels anymore. So this is why they called it the retina display, because it has essentially a resolution that is on par with the human retina. Yeah? So with the resolution of your eye. 
And if you would want to have the highest resolution on the retina for the entire field of view, then you would need a camera with uh, 580 megapixels. So a 580 megapixel camera over a field of view of 210 degrees would be able to sample the entire visual system of the human. Note that this is at full resolution, but your eye is not built like a camera, so you don't have a uniform resolution over the retina. So there's areas like the fovea where you really have the high resolution, but in the outskirts you don't have this high resolution anymore, which means that the 580 megapixels they would only be required in order to sample everything as full resolution. Your eye is using many, many tricks in order to give you the impression that you have this resolution over the entire field of view because it memorizes where you looked at and saves the high resolution information and then plays this back to your brain. So your eye is definitely not working like a camera system and it doesn't have uniform resolution, which is of course also one of the reasons why there are so many optical illusions that suddenly you perceive something that isn't there and so on. This is because of the anatomy and the functioning of the eye. Also for video, you typically have 24 frames per second that are perceived as a continuous video by humans. But again, your eye is not a camera system. You can still see flickering up to a frequency of 50 hertz. So if you want to have a completely flickering free impression, you need a 100 hertz device in order to be able to get rid of any flickering effect. So this is why sometimes people like to buy 100 hertz television just to make sure that there is no flickering. I think with the LCD and OLED systems, uh, this effect is much less. But of course, with the cathode ray tubes, then you really had these half images per second and the flickering was much more of a problem. And this is why the uh, people like to buy 100 hertz systems. And if you talk to a professional gamer, they will tell you they see the difference with 240 frames per second. So they need more frames per second just to be sure that they can be very accurate in playing their games. So, but according to research and what we know in published studies, 50 hertz should actually be enough. But, you know, if you're a hardcore gamer and if you can beat everybody else, maybe they have super good perception that helps them to be on top of all the world ranking lists. So maybe they have a much better visual system than other humans. Okay, so I think this is a key learning that you have here that the digitization is driven by the purpose. And whenever you digitize something, you need to know the purpose. And this also drives us when we're building medical imaging systems. We want to have a diagnostic purpose. So when we do medical images, it's not like with cameras or with, you know, human computer interfaces where the human perception is the factor, but in medical imaging, the diagnosis is the relevant factor. So here all sampling and system design is done with respect to performing an optimal diagnosis. And this is also why we use these many different systems and many different mechanisms. So here we have another purpose, but generally digitization is always driven by purpose. If the purpose changes, you want to digitize in a different way. Good. So if you have further questions, send me a note, leave comments, get in contact with the online forums. It's no problem. We try to keep up with that as quickly as possible. 
And of course, I also have some further readings for you. In particular, in our textbook, the chapter on systems theory by Peter Fisher. It's really well written. It contains a lot of more of the math. So there's a couple of geek boxes that you can actually read this chapter twice, once with few math and then geek boxes with a lot of math. And maybe this is still a bit early. Maybe you want to go back to that chapter in one or two semesters. And there you can then really get all of the additional information, all the additional math that we're providing here. So it's not just that this textbook should be a good companion for this class, but it should also be a good reference when you're in the field and you want to remember some things about systems theory or other modalities, then you can go back to our book and review that specific chapter. And again, it's completely open access, so you can download it for free. And of course, it will also be downloadable for free in the future. So, of course, there's also other very good reading, and in particular, the Einführung in die Systemtheorie. So this is a reference in German. If you do speak German, then this is also a very good read, and I definitely recommend to have a look at that. Okay, so this already ends our series of videos on systems theory. So you realize that this was a bit mathy. It will still stay a bit mathy for over the next couple of videos, because in the next videos we will look into the image processing part. So there we specifically now look at 2D images and how 2D images are processed. Again, we will see the concepts of Fourier transforms, impulse responses, and convolution. These concepts will come up again. But we will also discuss a couple of simple algorithms that can help you with improving image characteristics. So I hope you liked this little video and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye bye.